I am going to uh, introduce Dr. Carrie Lifshitz, but first of all, I want to mention um, a thank you to her in-laws who are on as well, Izzy and Pinky Lifshitz, who connected us. Um, so for many of us here, the issues or in general, coronavirus obviously gives everyone anxiety, but you wonder what is there to protect ourselves, whether it's something that you can do before ever being infected or, or ill with the virus, which we all pray that we don't get it. But then again, there is so much research that's being done. And the question is, is there anything of value to us that you can use before ending up in a hospital or even at a hospital? And I think the most um, controversial one, if I, I don't even know if that's the right word, but the most talked about one was hydroxychloroquine, which became uh, in the beginning of the coronavirus madness, President Trump said, this is the, the cure and clearly it's not. Um, so we have Dr. Lifshitz today, who is going to share, uh, shed some light on specifically on that drug and of course, any of the other um, remedies or drugs that are out there. And of course, she'll be able to answer your questions. I just want to share a little bit about her. Um, and, I'm, and, and Carrie, you can fill in any of the blanks uh, following that. But Carrie, or Dr. Lipschitz, earned a Bachelor of Science in Neuroscience from UCLA. She then earned a Master's Degree in Education from Drexel University. She earned her PhD in Neuroscience from the University of Pennsylvania. Um, where she specifically studied the addictive properties of drugs of abuse. And her main research was studying the effects of drugs on the brain. But she also has a uh, love for teaching. And this is the uh, love for studying pharmacology and love for teaching that led her to her job teaching at the University of Kentucky College of Pharmacy um, for six years until she moved to Arizona. And as you, uh, many of you were on here when her husband Dr. Jonathan Lifshitz spoke as well um, on that was also I'm not sure if that's how you met because you're both doing stuff with the neuro uh, studies is that how you both met or we, did, we met an undergraduate at UCLA and we were in neuroscience classes together but we also played roller hockey together so yeah. <laughs> okay there you go <laughs> all right so I'm going to pass over the mic I'm going to spotlight you and if you wanted to see the crowd before you start sharing anything, you can change that to gallery view. So without any further introduction, this is Dr. Carrie Lifshitz, and thank you for uh, presenting today. Great. Well, thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate this uh, opportunity. Um, it's been quite a while since I've had to make a PowerPoint presentation, so hopefully it's not too rusty. And I hope that... Um, this doesn't get either too basic or too scientific. I've tried to make it so that we're on an, a level playing field so that everybody is on the same page when I'm talking about different things. So I am going to go ahead and share my screen because I have a PowerPoint and let's put this into um, Where are we? I'm going to go into uh, let's see, present mode. Okay. Can you all see my screen? Okay. Thumbs up. Yeah, we're good. Okay, good. So um, this is my, I titled this to be a scientific approach to potential COVID-19 treatments. And the reason I wrote scientific is because I want to make sure that this is clear. We're or have a politics aside. This is not a political talk. This is purely scientific. This is coming from my way of looking at the science and how I've researched it since probably February of 2020, once coronavirus um, became, once it became apparent that coronavirus was not going away. Um, also, I would like to just sort of say I am not a medical doctor, so I cannot give you personal medical advice. What I can do is tell you about the research that has been done and give you my personal opinion on what is credible and what is not credible. So some of the drugs, I think the three most talked about drugs that have made the news recently are remdesivir, azithromycin, and of course, like Rabbi Levi um, mentioned, hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine. I will spend most of the time talking about hydroxychloroquine, but I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about remdesivir and a little bit about azithromycin, just so you guys have some background on those. So the first thing I think we need to talk about before we 
delve into potential treatments for coronavirus is make sure everybody is on the same page with how coronavirus actually works. So here we have, I'm sure you guys have all seen this coronavirus um, projection. <laughs> so this is a tiny little virus and it is important to note that viruses do not live on their own and they cannot replicate on their own. They are parasites and they require other cells in order to replicate. So we have here a host cell, which can be any cell in a human being. The first thing that happens is coronavirus sort of binds to the edge here of the cell and it's taken in by the host cell. Once it is in the cell, it then releases its viral RNA. So back to biology classes, humans are based on DNA. This virus is an RNA virus. RNA replicates more quickly and it's more easily replicated. So once coronavirus enters a host cell, it releases its viral RNA. And then the really fascinating thing about this, and if it weren't so dangerous, it would be just amazing to behold, is that it, it infiltrates the cell and it hijacks the cell's machinery to produce more viral RNA. So on its own, it has no capability of producing more viral RNA or replicating itself, but it can take over a cell's machinery in order to replicate and make more viral RNA. And once you have more viral RNA, then you're perfectly able to produce more coronavirus. And then that coronavirus is now released into the body and able to infect new cells. So it's really, it's easy to see how, you know, you have one cell that can invade the body and you can produce hundreds to thousands of coronavirus um, replication in, in a relatively short amount of time. So the first thing I wanna talk about is remdesivir. This is an antiviral medication. And the very first thing I wanna say about this is that it's administered IV. So this is not a drug that you can go to your local CVS and say, hey, I would like a prescription for remdesivir in a pill form. It is not available in that form. It is only administered IV. And this drug came about back in around 2009, and they were looking at it to treat hepatitis C. And what they found was that it wasn't effective for hepatitis C. But then back in 2015, if you remember, West Africa was suffering from that Ebola outbreak. They came back and looked at remdesivir to see if that was gonna be effective in helping with Ebola, and it showed promise with helping with Ebola. And so they started clinical trials on this drug to treat Ebola. There were other um, therapies that proved to be more useful than remdesivir, but what happened was they did have those clinical trials to talk about the safety background of remdesivir. So we do have that background to know what the safety profile of this drug. So because it wasn't effective with Ebola virus, Gilead stopped producing it and they weren't really actively producing it. Fast forward to January of 2019 to where we have this coronavirus. This is the exact same slide that I just showed you where it enters the cell, it releases its viral RNA, and then it uses the cell's machinery to produce more viral RNA. What we've shown, or what not we, but what scientists have shown is that remdesivir enters the cell and it prevents coronavirus from hijacking the cell's machinery to produce more viral RNA. So that step is essentially blocked. So now you can't make new viral RNA, there's no new coronavirus, and there's no new coronavirus released into the body. So that sounds great, right? The problem is, is that like I said, as of January 2020, Gilead, which is the company that makes remdesivir, was not actually producing remdesivir actively. They have since ramped up production. The issue, there are two issues with remdesivir. One is that it's very complicated to make, and some of the steps take weeks to actually make. Also, it is because it is administered IV, there are sterile um, complications. You have to make sure that it's completely sterile because it's going directly into the bloodstream. So there are heightened security measures that have to be taken when they are making this drug. They have ramped up production and they have contacted other labs to help them ramp up production. 
they're predicted to have, um, they, they predicted by the end of May that they were gonna have about 140,000 treatment courses. And a treatment course is a 10-day course of remdesivir. And, I, and again, I'll just make sure you understand, this is a treatment course that would occur in a hospital setting only. So you, if you were infected with coronavirus and did not have very um, severe symptoms, you likely would never get prescribed remdesivir at this point. They are predicted to have more than 500,000 treatment courses by the end of October, hopefully 1 million by December, and then the several million treatment courses in 2021 if it's still required. So there's good news, bad news with the remdesivir. Good news is, is that it does, studies have shown that it does work um, or it does show uh, effects in treating coronavirus. The bad news is we just don't have enough of it right now. And it will be some time before we have enough of it. So right now it is what they're saying, the FDA has mainly restricted this to compassionate use. So people with extremely severe symptoms of COVID-19. Okay. So I know that you probably already know this already with azithromycin, but I'm just gonna go over it to make sure that we are all on the same page because I'm gonna bring up azithromycin later on in, when I'm speaking. Um, azithromycin or ZPAC or Zithromax is a macrolide class of antibiotics. Now, what does that mean? It is part of a class of antibiotics made by a specific strain of bacteria, okay? There's a lot of other antibiotics in this class, but it is just called a macrolide class. And the reason I tell you this is I'm gonna use that word later on. It is a broad spectrum antibiotic, which just means that azithromycin is usually one of the first antibiotics that will be prescribed for some any bacterial infection. I'm sure everybody on this call has probably gotten, uh, gotten prescribed azithromycin on more than one occasion. Here's the thing, azithromycin is an antibiotic, so it only inhibits the growth of bacteria. It does not have effect on viruses. Now, when you hear about people getting treated with azithromycin right now when they're in the hospital because of COVID-19, it is most likely because they have developed some sort of secondary bacterial infection, and that azithromycin is being used to treat that secondary bacterial infection. It is not being used to treat COVID-19. Now, there was one in vitro, and in vitro means that it's in a petri dish. It is not inside a living being. It is simply in a lab setting um, that back in 2012 that showed that there is a possible helpful activity between azithromycin coupled with other antivirals, but there is absolutely no clinical evidence that suggests that azithromycin alone is effective in treating COVID-19. So please do not run out and try to get um, antibiotics to try to treat this. But we will talk more about azithromycin a little bit later in conjunction with hydroxychloroquine. So now the big one, which you probably all know about, this is probably why you're here to hear about this, is hydroxychloroquine, which is known as Plaquenil or chloroquine, which is known as Aralin. These drugs have multiple effects. The first effect is, the main effect is that they are immuno, immunomodulatory. Now, what does that mean? That means that it can modulate or change the effectiveness of the immune system. That is important because people with autoimmune disorders where their own immune, immune system is attacking their body need to have their immune system modified. And that's what this drug is used for. So people who suffer from lupus, people who suffer from rheumatoid arthritis, this drug is key for helping many of them relieve some of their symptoms. So the immune modulatory effects are not really relevant to the effects of, uh, on coronavirus. These two effects down here the alkaline effects in the cell, and the fact that it allows influx of zinc into the cell. These are two possible mechanisms that are relevant to the treatment of COVID-19 and two mechanisms that I will discuss further in the next few slides. But the first thing I want to say before we get on to these next two slides is that all of the following hypotheses that I am about to present 
are based on studies that have been done once again in vitro. That means they've been done in a petri dish in a lab. There are no studies that have been done to look at this in vivo in a human body or in a living being's body. So we're gonna focus first on the alkaline effects in the cell. We're gonna talk about acidic versus basic. Once coronavirus enters the cell, this is the same slide that I've been showing you, it enters this little pocket here and this pocket is very acidic. And it needs to be acidic in order for coronavirus to be able to release its viral RNA into the cell. So what chloroquine does is it enters the cell and it's hypothesized that this decreases the acidity in this area and thus does not allow release of the viral RNA into the cell. So back with remdesivir, that stops more viral replication. With chloroquine, it actually stops it a step earlier. It stops it from releasing the RNA into the cell. That's one hypothesized mechanism. The second hypothesized mechanism is that it helps zinc get into cells easier. Now zinc, you probably know, uh, there have been studies that have shown it helps with the immune system. The issue with zinc is that it has a hard time entering the cell on its own. But if you have chloroquine and zinc, chloroquine actually makes it easier for zinc to get into the cell. And then what zinc does is that it prevents more viral RNA from being produced. Okay. So this is not a direct effect of chloroquine, but it would be a chloroquine in conjunction with zinc. Now, I wanna actually stop for a second and see, um, are there any questions before we move on? I don't know, let me look and see. Um, people can unmute, if you do have a question, they can unmute or if they put it in the chat. I did not see any in the chat. I, okay. ha I had one that I sent to you through the chat. Um, but that was with remdesivir, so maybe just leave it for later. Okay. All right. Um, so, excuse me. Yes. I have a question. Uh, my name is Myra. Hi, Myra. If you take zinc mm -hmm. as a supplement, would that help you? So if you take zinc as a supplement, it certainly doesn't hurt. But zinc on its own is not going to do anything because zinc does not get into the cells very easily. So if you happen to be infected with coronavirus and you are also taking zinc supplementally, I don't think it will hurt you, but I don't think that zinc alone is going to stop the R RNA from being produced because it doesn't enter the cell very easily. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. So I want to go on to talk about some of the I will say controversy because there's a lot of controversy surrounding hydroxychloroquine. Um, first of all, I will say that I have been interchangeably using hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine. Let me make it clear. These are actually two different drugs. Chloroquine is the main drug and then hydroxychloroquine is a variant of that drug and hydroxychloroquine tends to have fewer side effects. They do very similar things but chloroquine tends to be a little bit more powerful. And that's why these in vitro studies that I just mentioned looked at the effects of chloroquine, not hydroxychloroquine. It is hypothesized that hydroxychloroquine would work in much the same way though. Some of the adverse effects of hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine include irreversible visual changes, um, especially in younger patients, um, uh, hydroxychloroquine has been shown to bind to the melanin in the eyes and developing eyes, and that can lead to long-term um, visual problems. One of the main ones that have been getting a lot of press is this abnormal heart rhythm that can be caused by hydroxychloroquine. Um, muscle weakness or nerve pain, low blood glucose. Um, if you suffer from psoriasis, perhaps you can get the worsening of psoriasis. And this is in addition to all the myriad adverse effects that you're going to hear on typical pharma pharma pharmaceutical commercials, you know, the um, gastrointestinal effects, um, dizziness, headaches, 
all those things are also with hydro hydroxychloroquine. But these are ones, some of the ones that are most concerning with this drug. And the reason that this has got a lot of press is that early on, there were some positive results. I know this is a lot of words on this slide. I'm just gonna briefly go over this. Um, there was a study that looked at 100 people in China that people treated with chloroquine had less severe symptoms and a shorter duration of COVID-19. This though, and this is where my scientific ears perk up because this was a letter submitted to a journal. As a scientist, what I look for when I'm reading research and I'm reading research papers, I look for studies that are in journals that are peer reviewed. In other words, journals where other scientists have read this paper before it was published and said, hey, listen, the science here is sound, their statistical analysis is sound, and we believe that the methods were very good. So I look for that and a, and a letter is not peer reviewed at this point. Now I will say that right now things are happening so fast that it is very difficult to get a peer reviewed article published right now be because usually science and science articles take sometimes months and years to get published. So the fact that we have studies happening, that's a, that's a win in itself. Um, so we can't, we can't check off all the little boxes on whether or not this, this is a peer reviewed um, journal or whether or not this is perfect science. We do need to um, have some sort of leniency with that. The study that has gotten the most publicity is this one from France. And I think this is the one that the president was referring to when he, was, when he first brought up the idea of hydroxychloroquine is that people treated with hydroxychloroquine had a lower amount of coronavirus in the body, or they call this a viral load. The issue with this study is that um, there were two studies that were done. The first one had about 36 participants. There was no control group, which means there was only people treated with hydroxychloroquine. We don't know how people reacted that weren't treated. And that's really important in these studies to have a control group to know what non-treatment versus treatment does. And then finally, there was another study in China with 62 people in it that looked at um, people treated with hydroxychloroquine recovered one day sooner than those that were treated without treatment. So those are a few of the, the positive results that um, we've shown or that scientists have looked at. There are a number of negative results um, for example, there was an 11-person study that showed that there were no effects on recovery. Um, in China, there was another study of 150 people that showed no effects on recovery. Again, though, this is not peer-reviewed, so we have to be consistent on how we're criticizing these articles, whether it's a positive result or a negative result. There was a VA study done by the United States Veterans Administration that looked at and showed that people treated with hydroxychloroquine had higher death rates than those that received no treatment. That was done with 368 people. The caveat to this though, is that it was done retrospectively. So that people that were in the hospital that had more severe symptoms were more likely to get treated with hydroxychloroquine. So that could be messing with the data as well. So that might be why there's a higher death rate with hydroxychloroquine treatment. Um, with the number of cases in New York, there have been a lot of studies that have looked on the effects of hydroxychloroquine, two different studies, one with um, over 1,300 patients and one with over 1,400 patients. Both of those showed no effects of hydroxychloroquine on recovery. Another one from France showed no beneficial effects and then one from China showed no effects on recovery. There's one study that I will focus on though right now, which is a study that was recently uh, published. It was last week actually in The Lancet. And The Lancet is a peer reviewed journal. And I'm not gonna say this is a perfect study because it's not, um, but this is definitely the most comprehensive study that, have been, that has been done so far on hydroxychloroquine. And this looked at over 96,000 hospitalized patients. 
81,000 of them had no treatment. Over 1,800 were treated with chloroquine alone. Over 3,700 were treated with chloroquine plus a macrolide antibiotic. Do you remember earlier when I was talking about azithromycin and how that's a macrolide antibiotic? This is the class that azithromycin is, is part of. So it was either azithromycin or another antibiotic that is in that similar class. There were over 3,000 that were treated with hydroxychloroquine and over 6,000 treated with hydroxychloroquine plus a macrolide. Now this study was very comprehensive. They looked at differences with um, uh, gender issue, differences with um, racial background. They looked at differences in pre-existing conditions. Um, so it was very comprehensive and they have a lot of data in this. But I'm going to focus on three or four data points. So the first one is patients who developed new cardiac disorders. Now, as you can see, patients that weren't treated with anything <clears throat> had a 0.3% rate of developing new cardiac disorder. 0.3% of them developed a new cardiac disorder, meaning they had no cardiac disorder when they went in the hospital. And after they um, were in the hospital, they developed a new cardiac disorder as a result of being infected with coronavirus. Patients that were treated with chloroquine alone developed new cardiac disorders. 4.3% of them developed these new disorders. When you're talking about chloroquine plus a macrolide, that was at 6.5% of the patients developed new cardiac disorders. Hydroxychloroquine alone treatment led to 6.1% of the patients developing new cardiac disorders. And hydroxychloroquine plus a macrolide, again, that's azithromycin, there is an 8% increase in, or 8% of the patients develop new cardiac disorders. So that right there is a little bit of a concerning um, result because you have hydroxychloroquine on its own has a potential to have an adverse effect of producing irregular heart rhythms and azithromycin on its own also as lesser known, but there isn't a, a small chance of an adverse effect of that also having irregular heart rhythms. When you put those two drugs together, you increase that chance of an irregular heart rhythm. The total length of hospital stay, when patients had no treatment, the average length of hospital stay was 11.7 days versus treatment with any of these, with chloroquine, chloroquine plus macrolide, hydroxychloroquine, hydroxychloroquine plus a macrolide, all of those were about average of 13 to 13.8 days. And then finally, another important one is mortality rate. People who received no treatment had a 9% of them passed away versus when people were treated with chloroquine, 16.4% had a mortality rate Chloroquine plus a macrolide, 22% mortality rate. Hydroxychloroquine alone was 18%, and hydroxychloroquine plus macrolide treatment is 23% mortality rate. None of these numbers, despite the fact that they're very high patient numbers, there are a lot of patients in this study, none of these numbers are actually statistically significant. Okay, these are all trends. They seem very big, like the differences are very big, but they are all trends. And there are scientists who are questioning how some of this data um, was analyzed. So this study also is not perfect. But again, we have to take what we can get in these times because it takes a long time for studies to, to go through the peer review process and for science to be, very, to be sound. So, I've given you all this information and it's a lot and I understand it was done pretty quickly. What can we say for sure? In my opinion, I have not seen any evidence that hydroxychloroquine can prevent infection with coronavirus. There's no evidence that I have found, no scientific study that says if you take hydroxychloroquine prophylactically, you will not be infected with coronavirus. I'm pretty confident in saying that that is true. 
all the mechanism studies with respect to how hydroxychloroquine works and might have antiviral properties have been done in vitro only in a Petri dish. Obviously, we cannot have, we're not at the point where we have studies that have been done in humans on the effects of coronavirus. So we always need to keep that in mind because a Petri dish in a lab is a perfect environment, whereas our bodies, everybody's different. Hydroxychloroquine does have adverse effects. And the other confounding factor here is that we simply do not know enough about coronavirus and the effects of coronavirus to say uh, whether coronavirus itself is going to increase irregular heart rhythms or have an effect on the heart. And if that's the case, then it's doubly dangerous to pair that with hydroxychloroquine treatment. So we, there's just not enough known right now to be able to confidently say anything about whether or not hydroxychloroquine is the sort of miracle drug that we've been looking for. The one thing I can say for sure is that there is a shortage now of hydroxychloroquine because this drug has been touted as a possible treatment for COVID-19, there has been a higher demand on this drug than normal. So now people who take Plaquenil, which is hydroxychloroquine for rheumatoid arthritis and lupus and other autoimmune disorders who depend on this drug in order to safely get through a day without having major discomfort, they cannot now get the drug that they so desperately rely on because there now has been sort of a run on the market of hydroxychloroquine. And people who are taking this, who want this drug to try and take prophylactically or who think they want to have this drug just in case they get infected with coronavirus, they are preventing people who actually need this drug. Now, maybe once um, the production of it is ramped up, this won't be as much of an issue. But as of right now, this is sort of a real issue that we have to worry about. Taking this away from people who use this drug daily before coronavirus came around that the adverse effects of it outweighed the adverse effects that they were experiencing from either rheumatoid arthritis or lupus or any, auto, uh, any other autoimmune disorder. So that is, that is one thing that we're very concerned about. And that's actually about it. I do have a slide here with all the references of the studies that I looked at. So in case any of you, and I believe this is gonna be shared on Facebook or something. So any of you who are interested, feel free to look at those references. And now I'm ready to take questions if anybody has questions. So I, anyone who does have a question, either you can uh, post it in the chat or uh, unmute your mic. I, I do have a question that I wrote to you privately earlier and I can read the questions. What's, what's your preference? Um, well, I just stopped sharing my screen so I can now see the chat easier. Okay. So, uh, so um, I'm side, are, there, are there any side effects to remdesivir and is it, or is it for everyone? Um, right now, um, remdesivir, there are a few side effects, um, but the side effects of remdesivir are not as severe. Actually, I should say the adverse effects because side effects sort of, yeah, anyway, the adverse effects of remdesivir outweigh um, the adverse effects of COVID-19. So anybody who is treated with remdesivir is done in a hospital setting under a physician's um, guide, guidance. And then I'm just going to ask a couple of questions that people, some of the questions that were asked me are from my brother, who is a very big HCQ uh, Twitter researcher. Okay. You know, they say he has the certificate of a Facebook doctor. Um, so here are some of the questions. And then, of course, I'm hoping people will jump in because some of these are probably, I, I know that a lot of um, information that comes out, they call it anecdotal. Correct. So can you share a little bit of how, um, I'm going to say the, the medical field looks at anecdotal data? Anecdotal data is kind of like that one study that I showed you that came out from China with the 100 people that they looked at. Um, and it was a letter that they published in a journal. It wasn't peer reviewed. It was just something that they noticed. Um, there are possible other effects of hydroxychloroquine that anecdotally have been noticed when looking at that with regard to other um, aspects of its effects. So. 
anecdotal evidence is some is usually what gets further research to occur. Um, but it's definitely not something that we would rely on. Got you. And then um, I guess this is the only other real question I have over here that someone asked me. So because they're from all of the um, drugs that you mentioned, there isn't a perfect solution. Even if, I mean, unless you're in the hospital and they start, you know, administering remdesivir. Um, as a as somebody who has researched this, would you take that risk? I guess not not as a prophylactic, but if you God forbid were positive with coronavirus before any major symptoms, would you go ahead and and take HCQ or whichever one, chloroquine or hydrochloroquine, hydroxychloroquine with uh, azithromycin, or you would stay away from that and just let your body do its thing? Because it's a risk either way. It is a risk either way, absolutely. Um, I would not take it with azithromycin because of the cumulative effects of uh, the possible heart arrhythmias. I'm concerned with both of those. Um, if I had a heart condition, I definitely would avoid it. Um, I, but I personally, I would not do it. And I would not... Um, have my kids on it either. And that's always one of those things that I always ask a doctor, would you have your kids do this? And I usually go by what their answer is. And, and I would not um, let my kids be on this. All right. And I see now people do have some questions. Um, so Sheldon, did you want to ask first? I see your mic's unmuted. Okay. Yes. I wait. Uh, the president has uh, been take, allegedly taking this drug. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Allegedly, yes. And do you know who the manufacturer of that drug is? Um, I don't have the name of the manufacturer right now. I, I know that its name is Plaquenil, but I, I don't remember which, which of the company is one that produces it. But, but it would seem to me that with the president taking this medication and so far, he hasn't had as long, as far as we know, any uh, arrhythmia problems, heart problems from it. Isn't that suggesting that other people should take it? So there's a number of things with that, and actually. And, and if you were the doctor for the president, would you allow him to take this, recommend that he take this medication? If I were the doctor or the president? Yes. Considering his age, considering his um, weight, and possibly other um, confounding factors, no, I absolutely would not allow him to take it. I think it is irresponsible. Um, but that's my personal opinion. Um, now uh, let me let me answer let me ask you to answer this question. I just remember it. Hydroxychloroquine is now uh, considered generic, so there are multiple companies that produce it. Okay. Thank you, Sheldon. Alan, did you want to ask a question? Yeah, I did. Um, this might be slightly off topic, but do you have any experience or have you done any research on antibodies? Meaning, if somebody has the antibodies, in your opinion, how effective is it? in terms of them transmitting the disease to others as well as um, getting it again? Yeah, that's another great question. Um, I would say we don't know yet. Um, there have been a number of studies recently come out that people have been reinfected with coronavirus who have already, um, who have already completed the, the, have already tested negative for it. Um, they had it once, they tested negative, and they have it again. Um, but again, there are, it's so early right now, it's hard to say for sure. I think one of the best examples of it is the example of some of the sailors on that aircraft carrier who were infected. Um, they were taken off the aircraft carrier. They were um, put into quarantine for, for, for the two weeks and they tested negative for it. They went back on the carrier and they were tested positive again later on. So I don't think we can say right now, if you get this once, you're immune. One of the things that happens with antibodies is with certain antibodies, the concentration when you are first, right after you first recover from the disease is very high, but that concentration can decrease. And as that concentration of antibodies decreases, you become less able to battle the infection. And that might be the case with coronavirus. We just can't say for sure yet. Thank you. Uh, Phyllis, did you have a question? Hold on, you are, I don't hear you, but you are unmuted. 
There you go. No, sorry. Try it again. If not, we'll come back to you. All right, we don't hear you for some reason. Does anyone hear her? No. Okay, I got nervous for a second. <laughs> Try it again, Phyllis. Uh, Levy, can I go? All right, Phyllis, you're still having issues. All right, Let's Steve, go for it. Type it in. Type it into your chat, Phyllis. All right, uh, Steve, go for it. Okay, um, how accurate are the tests? Is that po a possible cause for people getting re-getting the virus because the tests were not completely accurate? Do you mean the antibody test or do you mean the, um, the PCR, the, the test that actually tested for coronavirus? Either one or both. Yeah, there have been some issues with accuracy of tests. Um, I find it hard to believe though that if somebody has all the symptoms and are suffering, and a lot of the a lot of the inaccuracy with tests is false negatives. You don't really see a lot of false positives as much. At least that's my understanding. Um, so if they were diagnosed with uh, with COVID nineteen, it is probably um, the, the case that they had it. That's a good point. Um, Robin Valen, did you have a question? Yeah, I just have a question. I, I was, I, you may not know the answer to it. We have a friend who is diabetic, but, and him, he also, he got the a virus as well as his daughter and wife, but he did not have to go to the hospital and he did recover as she was a nursing assistant. She took his oxygen levels and so forth. Anyway, what makes a person like that uh, recover as opposed to somebody who, um, you know, can die from it or not be diabetic or even somebody. So I understand they have a higher risk, but is there any studies or I don't understand that. And there's a way to understand that. If any of us understood it, I think that we would be millionaires right now and we'd be winning a prize because I don't think anybody understands what makes a cer certain person more susceptible. Certainly, being diabetic makes you more susceptible to actually being infected with the disease. Um, I'm very happy that he recovered and he didn't have to be in the hospital. That's, that's wonderful okay. news. Um, but I don't know. I don't think anybody knows yet. All right. That is scary. It is. I'm diabetic too. <laughs> but I mean, I'm, I'm just saying I'm not on insulin or anything and my numbers are very good, but mm -hmm. it's scary. Yes, yeah. it is. Very much so. Okay, so um, I did get the question from Phyllis. And the question was, have you seen any studies that combine hydroxychloroquine, zinc, and a ZPAC as treatment? Um, no, I have not seen specific studies that I've looked at that. I am sure that there are people who were on zinc already that were possibly infected and then maybe they had treatment with hydroxychloroquine and ZPAC. Um, and, but I have not seen any studies that have elucidated that difference. That would be I, very interesting to look at. To jump in, I think Phyllis is referring to, as you probably know, there's a doctor who was all over Twitter and, and possibly the reason why Trump even um, took hydroxychloroquine, that's his trifecta, if I can call it that. He tells people to do those three items. Right. And I think that's probably because zinc has been shown to have some effects on the immune system in general. So, hope, so the idea is by taking zinc, you might not get infected. I don't think coronavirus, though, works the same way that other infections do. Um, certainly taking zinc, like I said, prophylactically, I don't think that harms you at all. Zinc is a naturally occurring substance. It's when you start talking about things like an antibiotic or a drug like hydroxychloroquine, which is not natural and is not naturally produced by the body, and you're introducing something that is not naturally produced by the body into the body, that's when you run the risk of having adverse effects. And then another uh, question from the, the chat. There was no vaccine for the Spanish flu and none for other serious SARS viruses. How did they disappear without a vaccine? It is my understanding that the Spanish flu did, um, people developed immunity to it. Um, I don't know, but we don't know yet if that's the case with coronavirus. So you're saying that's something that people pray for, that it sort of changes, it uh, mutates or something? Well, no, I think what I think the idea is, is 
once you were treated, once you were infected with Spanish flu once, you were immune from it forever. Okay. And I, I believe that was the case for Spanish flu. The problem with Spanish flu is that, especially back then, getting infected with it was so dangerous. Just like getting infected with the coronavirus, you don't know if you're going to recover from it or not, which is why herd immunity doesn't work with coronavirus. Got you. And I think this is sort of a follow-up question to the question earlier from Alan about the um, antibodies. So the question is, what about the blood plasma treatment? Yeah, I don't know a lot about that yet. Um, certainly, I think it's an interesting idea. If, and I think the idea behind this is if you have had coronavirus, if you've been infected with it, and you've recovered from it, the idea is that you have antibodies in your blood plasma, and then you can take that blood plasma and give it to somebody who is currently infected with it to try and fight off the disease. I think this is an interesting idea. I don't know how successful it's been yet. I don't, they are, correct, I, I don't know if they're actually even doing it yet. Well, so Al, they are because actually Alan, part of his question was he actually donated plasma to uh, Scottsdale on her health. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're, they're creating the bank, if you want to call it that. I don't and know about part of the reason for that is to help with the vaccine. Okay, interesting. So it's not I, just for the transfusions. Correct. I, I have a different question. Mm -hmm. Is there any known mask out there that the wearer can be pro protected as well as the others around them? The N95. Yeah, and and we can't, the general public can't get that one. Not easily, no, huh? No. But I will tell you though, just wearing a regular cloth mask is, and if, if everybody's doing that, that decreases if, by like 85 to 90 percent transmission. The if is the problem. Correct. You know, I'll wear it and protect you, but I go out and people aren't wearing them. So that's why I wondered if there's any way I could get protected. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Arlene, did you have a question or did you just you know, meet me? We've had a lot of friends, none of them here who've had the virus. One went in on May, uh, March 16th and never came out and died. He was in Florida. I'm All sorry. their friends got it in one group, okay? His brother got it in North Carolina. None of these people were together. His brother had the hydroxychloroquine in the hospital. He survived. I don't know. You know, I really don't know. We've had two rabbis, one in New Jersey, one in Florida that had it that we knew. And, you know, they all survived, but our one friend was 80. He had no problems, zero problem. He was overweight, but no problem. He did not survive. He went and she never saw him again. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. That's all. And that's one of the really sad things, too, is that, you know, somebody goes into the hospital and they end up getting really bad. They're, they're dying alone. And that's that is that breaks my heart. Yeah, um, they have Ten people at a funeral. That's that's it. Yeah. But, you know, so I don't know. I mean, one took it and, and, you know, came out. He did have problems when he came out. I don't know what the problems were. His daughter had it in another state. It's incredible. I mean, we know a lot of people that have had it, but nobody here. Thank God. So one other thing I'm going to say, though, and I'm going to throw a whole other, I probably shouldn't be saying this, but it's something else that I've thought about is that because this is so new, we don't know the long-term effects. So someone can recover, but we don't know what, what's going to happen long-term from now, because there's a lot of lung damage that occurs, especially in people that have severe cases. We also don't know why some people get infected with it and are completely asymptomatic. Um, and, and those people, will there be any long-term effects in those people? We have no idea at this point. Um, and that, you know, maybe there's going to be a study later on that says, oh, people in Italy are more susceptible because they have this huge outbreak there. You know, people who have an Italian descent are more susceptible because of some protein that they have in their body versus somebody who is a Hasidic Jewish descent, which have a different kind of protein in the body. Who knows? We have no idea. And but the studies will be done, and in ten to twenty years, we're going to have great data on this. <laughs> Do the lungs regenerate, or they don't? Um, depending on the damage, there can be. There, it's not really. Thank you. All right, Stevie Stacks, uh, go ahead. You hear? Okay, so um, uh, hold time out for a second. I did hear, hear you, Jerry. Okay. Several you, comments. You, asking somebody else first. you want to have yeah. that lady talk first? Yeah, go ahead. You can wait. <laughs> I got some comments. <laughs> okay, so they'll go right after Stevie. Okay, Stevie, go for it. Okay, so for those of us who already have asthma, allergies, and other COPD-related 
things. And we already have inhalers at home and nebulizers and all sorts of other stuff. How do you really know whether you just had an asthma attack <clears throat> or you have a really light case of uh, coronavirus? I mean, I've been sick for like six months now off and on, and it's like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, I could have had it. I don't know. Yeah, that, um, that's a great question. And there's like a couple of memes that have been going around saying, is it, is it allergies or coronavirus? I don't know. <laughs> Um, it's a great question, and I think a lot of people are, especially in the beginning of this, were, were waking up um, in at least Phoenix with all this pollen going around back in March, we're waking up with that question. Um, if, you, if you are very curious and you want to know, um, an antibody test would tell you if you, if you were exposed to it. Um, uh, taking a, a test for COVID-19 only will tell you if in that moment you are infected with coronavirus. It won't tell you if you have been in the past or anything like that, it's just the, that, that particular snapshot, um, it will tell you if you're infected. So a, as a body test will tell you if you were ever infected with it. So as a follow-up, what have you heard or read about the antibody tests? How accurate are they? Are they gonna become available to anybody who wants it? Um, I think the idea is that they will become available. Um, I think right now you can get them, but it's a little cost prohibitive at this point. Um, but I think the goal is to be able to test people with the antibody tests. But I'm not positive how far along they are on that. Thank you. And before Jerry asks this question, because it's really a follow-up to that, if someone did test positive for the antibodies um, and then reinfect if you want to call it that have you read anywhere if they suffer mildly or it's the same symptoms i think that i've heard that question before yeah i've heard that question and i i, I actually honestly can't answer that question i would scientifically i would say they probably have symptoms that are not as severe but but also you could look at it the other way and say well their their lungs are already damaged so they might have more severe interesting so it, it, you could you could see either way all right, Jerry, you ready? Okay, yeah, Bob, ready. Okay, hi, doctor. Um, about the ocular manifestations of uh, the hydroxychloroquine, it's my understanding that you have to take that a long time uh, to get at a big dose for a long period of time to get any ocular change. That's why people who have rheumatoid arthritis or lupus are advised to see an ophthalmologist once a year for checks. Okay, for months. so a five-day course or seven-day course is not going to get not going to be problems. I don't think. Also, uh, yeah. Also, what about these? Uh, what are the cardiac abnormalities we're talking about? I've never seen. One. I'm a cardiologist, and I've never seen in 46 years of practice anybody that ever had any problem with that actually Um They're talking about QT prolongation and yeah. AR arrhythmia. Are they? Are we talking about AV block? Are we talking about you know QT interval prolongation usually causes ventricular fibrillation or ventricular tachycardia, you know, deadly arrhythmias. So that's pretty obvious, but are we talk about minor little things or prolonged PR intervals or what are you talking about? Um, I, you probably know better than I do. I don't think I can answer that question. <laughs> well, Carrie, maybe the, maybe the better thing is to, uh, we'd have to look back in that Lancet study to see if they even write the details on that. They do actually, they do go into detail about um, the cardiac events. And I just, I, a, made it, I made it more simple for this right, right, to get too detailed. Today, in the Wall Street Journal, there's an op-ed about that study. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, I think it's been politicized. In fact, one of the editorial writers of The Lancet uh, wrote an article saying he wished President uh, Trump could get, get defeated next year, this year. <laughs> so it's a mixed, mixed but plus it's all the world. We don't know what was done where, who's got what. It hasn't really been broken down. To, but it's impressive in New York when that guy is <laughs> cranking up patients. You know, I think the problem here is twofold. Number one, you have to treat somebody early on in the course of the disease, you're going to have any result. Later on, you get that cytochrome, cytochrome, cytochrome uh, storm, and inflammation, and it's a different ball game. Correct. That's what kills them. So it has to be earlier treatment, I think. Well, they did control for that in the Lancet article. They did talk about when uh, 
the treatment occurred um, in, in terms of onset of symptoms and how far along the symptoms were, and they did uh, control for that as best as that they could. Um, the nice thing about the Lancet study is that it's not just one area, it has taken patients from a number oh. of different countries, so I don't know. It, yeah. But there are problems with it, you're absolutely right. There are issues with it. Also, there are higher instances of death and the ones they treated, because they're treating probably the sicker patients who have hypoxia and massive inflammation in the lungs. You're not going to help those people. Well, that was an issue with the VA study. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, it's funny that Jerry brought this up, because one of the things when I had asked you to present, and I'll just end off with this note, and if anyone has any other questions, um, I sent your father-in-law a video from an OBGYN in Florida who was saying that, you know, it was after Trump came out with his announcement and he said that he knew a lot of doctors on the front lines, including himself, who were taking hydroxychloroquine. And I don't know if he was saying with other uh, medicines or not, maybe zinc. Um, but one of the things that he mentioned was, and he quoted, I forgot the name of the book, but he called it, I might've written it down. He called it the Bible of pharmacists, the it's PDR. The physician's desk reference. The PDR. Okay, so PDR. And he, and he showed that a pregnant woman, it, it's safe enough for a pregnant woman to take hydroxychloroquine. So he said, why is it that everyone right. is going crazy That's about true. this medicine? If it's safe for a woman who's carrying a baby and it's not going to harm the baby, then how could you all of a sudden say it's so dangerous? And of course, there's side effects. I mean, every, I, I did see, I actually went, we, me and Izzy uh, checked out the entry. <laughs> yeah. Um, but in, in other words, is the, do you feel that the media is Pulling it up because it's become politicized a little bit, meaning the effects of it, or is there truly a fear for hydroxychloroquine? I think there's a couple of things to comment. Uh, the one comment is when you're talking about a pregnant woman, and you and you uh, are just have a discussion with an OBGYN, will have a discussion with a pregnant woman in the beginning of her pregnancy to see if she should continue on with drugs that she currently takes or not. And the big discussion, the big point there is, are the adverse effects of the drugs outweighing the adverse effects of the disease if you don't take the drug? And that is a big balance that you have to look at. For some of these autoimmune disorders, taking hydroxychloroquine is worth the risk of the, the of adverse effects that they would have um, if they didn't take it. Um, that's number one. Number two is dose. What is the dose we're looking at in terms of giving it to an, a person with an autoimmune disorder that takes it every day versus a dose that you would have to give to have um, effective uh, effects for treating um, coronavirus or treating COVID-19? Um, I had a third point and I totally forgot it. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I what guess, word? yeah, go for it, Jerry. One word about controlled trials. They're good if you can do them, if you have the time to do it, but in the midst of a massive epidemic like this, it's very difficult to do. You know, when penicillin came out, there was no controlled trial. If you had pneumococcal pneumonia, you got penicillin, you lived. If you didn't get the it, you died. So it was a fine area. Um, and then Carrie, just curious, because I know like my brother, in fact, we use WhatsApp as a family. He's created a WhatsApp group just for Corona, um, where he shares details <laughs> that he finds. And one of the things, and this is what I'll end with unless someone else has a question. And one of the things that he keeps on throwing at us who are on this subgroup is the, the, the negative data that they've been finding about the Lancet study. In other words, um, how faulty it is. And today, for example, his latest uh, thing that he shared was that they said that they had data from France hospitals, which included um, gender, ethnicity, and France has a law that does not share that in any study, which means that either they lied mm -hmm. or they made a mistake, right? That's the, right. so I'm curious, I guess a lot of people are really curious, especially when you read both sides of the news. And I hate to say that because the news has become both sides. It absolutely has. So do you trust the study tremendously or, or there really are big holes in its data? I can't say that I trust any study right now tremendously. Um, there are holes in every single study that have been done, um, whether it's a positive result or a negative result. So um, I can only rely on numbers. The fact that they had n over 19,000 people or over 90,000 people in the study. But that's part of the that data helps. I disagree with. 
Part, pardon me? That's part of the data that people argue about. How many people were actually involved in the study? Right, right. Because they're using, again, I, I only know what my brother sends me. I actually don't search for these things. Right. But everything that he's shared is about the surgery sphere company that has brought the data to them. And that's really where the holes are, not in the doctors necessarily who, who, who analyzed the data. It was more on the data set that they were given or using. Could it possibly be true that they had 90,000 um, patients to actually analyze? Uh, so th that, that's, I guess, really where it falls. No, absolutely. And, and there are holes. And, and uh, no, I can't say that I trust any study tremendously at this point. Um, I, I also can't say that I trust studies that only have 30 patients in them. Right, you can't. So um, it's... That's why I was wondering the about the biggest thing is we just don't know. That's why I, I like the anecdotal word, which sounds like Gary said that, you know, penicillin was either you tried it or you didn't. There, there was no study to really interesting. <laughs> this is really interesting. I, I appreciated this talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank, you, very you. Much. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate Any last it. questions for Carrie before we uh, let her uh, off of the uh, last part of the uh, <laughs> Question and answer, Steve, Steve unmuted. Do you have a question? Thank you. Myra, okay, awesome. Um, so before uh, we uh, officially end, I just wanted to share that tomorrow's uh, presentation is a local, I call him an activist because I think that's the right term. He's not paid for what he does. Uh, who's gonna talk about US-Israel relations in the sense of why he feels and why many feel um, the U.S. Congress should be involved in that, in the sense of the lobbying that's involved with that. Um, and please do bring your questions. You might agree with him, you might not. It's a great conversation to be had. Um, but again, thank you so much, Carrie, for your time. We yes, really thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. All right. If anyone wants to stay on and schmooze, we're.